Yeah, thank you to the organizers of this um, thematic month and the school for uh, inviting me to speak uh, or to give a, a course. Uh, I'm giving this course, of course, uh, jointly with uh, Manon Stipulanti from the University of Liège. And OK, this course is going to be an introduction to walnut. And well, what is walnut? Walnut is basically an implementation of a um, decidability algorithm for a, an extension of a certain first order theory of arithmetic called Pressburger arithmetic. And it's mostly useful for proving uh, theorems about a class of integer sequences called automatic sequences. And it can be used to prove many uh, classical and new original results in combinatorics on words. For example, um, it can prove things to so some, well, these are all classical results in the theory of combinatorics on words. For example, that the to a Morse, the word, is overlap free, or the squares in the to a Morse word have lengths a power of two or three times a power of two, or that the Fibonacci word contains exactly one palindrome of even length, of each even length, and, one, and two palindromes of each odd length. So, if you don't know what any of these things are, well, you should after uh, the end of the talk. Um, like most of the, uh, or like several of the other courses uh, in this school, um, this course will consist of uh, two lectures of theory and then uh, one uh, exercise uh, session. Um, and um, some information has been posted on the um, uh, website um, that uh, Pierre Guillon has shared with everyone on um, how to install this, uh, this software and so on. So if you can, please try to download and install the software before the exercise session on Thursday. Um, but I mean, for today and for my, my part of this presentation, I will be uh, telling you about the theory. Um, well, about some of the theory uh, behind Walnut. And I should also say that, in fact, most of the material that I'm going to present to you um, is basically material that uh, is based on uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Shallot's uh, book, which you can see here, The Logical Approach to Automatic Sequences, Exploring Combinatorics on Words with Walnut. This book basically gives a much more detailed um, explanation of everything. Um, so yeah, if you at the end, if you want to know more, um, you can always go look there for a lot more than what I'm going to tell you today. So the Walnut um, program is based on the theory of several different areas. Um, in particular, it um, uses the theory of numeration systems, the theory of finite automata and regular languages, the theory of automatic sequences, and some theory of uh, first order uh, logic, specifically some extensions of the Pressburger arithmetic. And um, because I don't really know for sure what uh, background knowledge 
all the participants have. Um, I will try to explain things uh, starting from really the basics. So, of course, some of you will know a lot of this already. Um, but uh, I will try to explain um, starting from the very basics. So let's start with uh, numeration systems. So um, the theory of numeration systems is the first kind of piece of the theory that we need to understand to understand um, how this walnut works. Um, Okay, of course, we start with the usual uh, integer base representation, um, which of course, um, you all know, right? This is, you know, everything is based on this particular theorem, which says that uh, basically that every non-negative integer has a unique representation uh, in whatever chosen integer base k, right? Where, of course, the, you, know, you write n as a sum of powers of k in this way, where the coefficients here can be any digit between 0 and k minus 1, uh, and the first digit should be not 0. And we write the base k representation as a string over this alphabet. Now, for what we are going to do, we are going to need to represent not just single integers, but tuples of integers, okay? And this is how we're going to do it. So if we want to represent a t-tuple of integers, we will represent the digits as words over the alphabet zero to k minus one to the t, um, yeah, to the t. So basically the idea here is, um, okay, well maybe it's easier just to see on an example. If I want to represent a pair of integers 23 and six, okay, I write 23 in binary and six in binary, and I put the representation of 23 in the first components of this sequence of pairs, right? So I have a sequence of pairs of digits, and the first component of each pair spells out the binary representation of 23. Yeah, so one, zero, one, one, one should spell out the binary representation of 23. And then reading the second component, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, should spell out the binary representation of 6, except in this case, I have had to put in some leading zeros, yeah? To make sure that it, it the binary representation of 6 has the same length as the binary representation of 23, right? So I pad the smaller one on the left with leading zeros, so they have the same length, and then this is how I encode a pair of integers, and okay, you can figure out the generalization to um, triples and k-tuples, right? And the next thing I have to um, explain is that we will be working not only in the usual integer based numeration system, but also in some more exotic numeration systems, you know, some strange non standard numeration systems. Um, the only one really that I'm going to tell you about is the Fibonacci numeration system, although other numeration systems are possible. In this case, the idea is pretty simple. We take the integer based numeration system, which is based on place values in base 
k, the place values are powers of k. So in the Fibonacci enumeration system, the place values now become Fibonacci numbers. All right, so the ones place is still the ones place, but then the second place is the twos place, and then there's a threes place, and a fives place, and an eighths place, and so on. Right? So, yeah, the place values are the numbers uh, from the Fibonacci sequence here. And the important thing is this theorem here, which says, much like in the integer base, that any uh, non-negative integer can, represent, can be represented as a sum of Fibonacci numbers, in this case, with coefficients either zero or one. So it's not, uh, it's not difficult to show that. The only difference here is that when you are working in the Fibonacci numeration system, this kind of sum is not necessarily unique. Right? The integer base representation gives you a unique representation of each uh, non-negative integer. But uh, in the case of the Fibonacci representation, that is not true um, because, well, because of the Fibonacci recurrence, right? For example, if I want to take the number 13, 13 can just be 13, or it could be the sum of eight and five, right? So, oh, okay, here's some, here are some examples, right? 10 is the sum of these two Fibonacci numbers, eight plus two, or it could be the sum of these three Fibonacci numbers, eight plus, uh, five plus three plus two. But we can eliminate the um, ambiguity or this multiple representations by forbidding, um, by not allowing you to use two consecutive Fibonacci numbers in your representation, right? So if you did have two consecutive Fibonacci numbers, just remove them and replace it with the next bigger one by the Fibonacci recurrence, right? So you were just not allowed to have, to use uh, consecutive Fibonacci numbers in your representation. What that means, of course, is that you will not see one one in the actual string representing your integer, right? So here now, the sort of canonical Fibonacci representation of 12 is one, or I guess in this case, it's what, eight plus three plus one. Right? Okay, so that's about all that I will say about numeration systems. And uh, those are the only numeration systems we'll use in this particular lecture, are the integer bases and uh, the Fibonacci sequence just so you get a better idea of what the actual strings look like of representing each number. Well, here they are, right? One is one, two is two, three is three, four is three plus one, five is five, six is five plus one, seven is five plus two, etc. right? 17, I guess, is 13 plus three plus one, All right? So, this, these strings here are, are called, that whole set of strings is called the numeration language. Okay. It's fine so far? Okay, so, like I said, um, this uh, theory of walnut is based on theory of Numeration systems, and now the theory of uh, finite automata. So I'm sure many of you uh, know this, but uh, let me just give a very quick um, explanation of the basics. 
A finite automaton is a computing machine that has only finite memory, right? It just has some finite uh, list of states uh, or set of states. Um, and it takes some input. It reads the input one symbol at a time, moving from left to right. And as it processes the input, while well, it starts in some designated initial state, and it has a finite transition table that just tells it, okay, based on what state I'm currently in and what symbol I'm reading right now, what uh, the ne next state I should transition to is, right? And it just proceeds like this, moving one symbol at a time and just updating its state uh, as it reads each symbol. And certain states are designated final or non-final, or accepting or rejecting. So after you've read your input, when you've finished, uh, when you've completed reading your input, whatever state you're in, if it's a final state, you accept your input. If it's a non-final state, you reject your input. And the language accepted by the automaton is the set of all strings accepted by the automaton. And the class of all languages that can be accepted by finite automata is the class of regular languages. So here is an example of a finite automaton. It has four states, A, B, C, and D. It's operating on the binary alphabet. The initial state is the one marked with the, just that incoming arrow from nowhere. The final states are marked with the double circle, right? And the transitions are just shown as labeled edges, right? So if you're in state A and you read a zero, you transition to state B, and so on, right? And in this case, this particular automaton will accept any binary string containing um, the substring 0, 1, 1, right? Because as soon as you see 0, 1, 1, you reach the final state D, and from there, you just stay there, whatever else you read, right? Okay, if your transition function maps the current state and the current input symbol to a single state, your automaton is said to be deterministic. If it instead maps the current state and input symbol to a set of possible states, then your automaton is non-deterministic. Mostly we will be working with deterministic automata, but non-determinism will be important for one specific thing. So I should just briefly mention how it works. The main point is that the two models of automata are equivalent. This is a classical result of automata theory. Right, so both types of automata will accept the same class of languages, so you don't get any more additional computing power um, by adding non-determinism. What you do get is um, possibly a more compact representation. So the two models are equivalent. You can convert any non-deterministic automaton into a deterministic one, but you may possibly increase the size of your automata exponentially. In the sense that if you were given a non-deterministic automaton with n states, there's a classical construction to convert it to a deterministic one, but the deterministic one might, in the very worst case, have two to the n states. So, there's this uh, exponential size uh, blow up. So what's important is that you can convert, you can always determinize. 
and that there's potentially uh, an exponential blow up in the size. All right. Okay. Uh, we will also, for convenience, need another equivalent model of um, regular languages, uh, namely um, regular expressions. So as I said, regular languages is the class of languages that can be computed by finite automata. They are also the class of languages that can be described by regular expressions. And a regular expression is just a way of describing a language, a set of strings, based on three basic uh, operations that you can then compose and build up. And the three basic operations are union, uh, concatenation of strings, and one more called the clean closure. And the way this works is we start with some very basic um, languages here. The empty set is represented by the empty set. Uh, the language containing the empty word, so the empty word here, this is the word of size zero, of length zero. The empty word, the language containing the empty word is just represented by the symbol for the empty word. And the language containing a single letter A, well represented just by the letter A. And then we have these three operations on languages. So if L1 and L2 are languages, okay, the union of languages is just the union of the two sets. Uh, the concatenation of L1 and L2 is the set of all strings that you can get by simply concatenating some string in L1 with some string in L2. And we represent that by just writing L1 followed by L2. This can be extended, of course, to the concatenation of several languages. And lastly, the clean closure. So if you take a language and concatenate it with itself, um, and then again with itself, and again with itself, k times, we write that L to the power k. And then if you take the union, L to the power k over all k, um, that union is called the Kleene closure and is written L star. I should say also that if you want the slides, I can ask uh, Pierre to put them on the website. Okay, so some very simple examples. The language of all binary strings is, okay, zero, union, one, star, right? Star just means zero or more copies of, in this case, zero or more copies of either zero or one. So that's all binary strings. All binary strings ending with a zero is zero, union, one, star, and then ending with zero, and so on. Right? Uh, language of all strings containing 101. One. I'll just put 101 one there. And then before it can be any string, and after it can be any string. Um, language of binary strings avoiding 1, 1. Well, if a string does not contain 1, 1, it can be um, factorized into a concatenation of either 0 or 0, 1 repeatedly, and then it might or might not begin with a one. And as I said, these are equivalent models of languages. Again, this is uh, one of the classical results of the theory of formal languages on automata is that the class of languages accepted by finite automata is equivalent to the class of languages that are generated by regular expressions, right? And there are standard constructions um, to show this equivalence, right? Which you would see in any 
um, introduction to formal languages on automata theory class. So we will be working extensively with finite automata, but what I want to do is I want a computing machine that can compute uh, an integer sequence for me. And right now, the model of finite automata is it either accepts or rejects input, that's it. It's a sort of binary zero or one thing, right? States are either final or non-final. It either accepts or rejects. What I want is I want it to actually compute some sequence over a larger but still finite alphabet. So instead of designating states as final or non-final, I associate an output function with each state. Right? So each, each state has an output associated with it. And now the idea is the finite automaton reads its input after it's finished processing its input, whatever state it ends up in, instead of accepting or rejecting, it will just output whatever its associated output is. This model is called the deterministic finite automaton with output. And now, here is how I use it to compute some integer sequence, right? So I have some sequence A. Uh, it's a sequence over some finite set, um, some finite alphabet. And the idea is I would like to provide N to my computing machine, my DFAO, and have the machine compute the nth term of the sequence, a n. So how do I provide the integer n to the machine? Well, I write it in some base. I write it in base k, right? So I write it in base k. I feed the base k representation of n into my automaton. And then wherever it ends up, it outputs something, and that is the value a n, the nth term of the sequence. Also in base k. No, the output is just a finite, output is just some finite list of, uh, it's just a finite uh, output alphabet. So it could be, it could be just a, b, c, d, for example. Output doesn't have to be in base k, it, because it's, it will always be just one of some finite um, set of symbols. So input is given in base k. Output is just one element from some finite set of symbols. OK, so in this case, here's my, my example. Here's um, a DFAO. Right, so it looks just like a DFA with states A and B. In this case, the output, um, the output alphabet is just zero and one. So this particular DFAO computes a sequence called the 2A Morse sequence. Right, so the idea is if I want to find the nth term of this sequence, I write N in binary, put it through the automaton, and it will output either 0 or 1, depending on where it goes. For example, if I wanted to know uh, what the seventh term of the sequence is, right? I would write 7 in binary, 1, 1, 1. And so I would follow 1, 1, 1 in the automaton. I would end up in state B, which outputs 1. So the seventh term of the sequence should be 1. And if I count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, it is a one, right? <coughs> and if you look carefully at what this thing is doing, you will see that that automaton is checking this rule. It's just count checking the parity of the number of ones in the binary representation of n, right? I mean, you can see, right? 
it's just going back and forth every time it sees a one. So it's just checking the parity of the number of ones in the binary representation of n. So if a uh, binary representation of n has an even number of ones, uh, you output zero. If it has an odd number of ones, you output one. And you get this famous sequence, the 2a Morse sequence. OK, here's another similar sequence. It's a sequence you get by folding a piece of paper. If you take a piece of paper and you fold it in half, and then you fold it in half, and then you fold it in half, and then you fold it in half, and you fold it in half infinitely many times, and then you unfold it, and then you write down the sequence of peaks and valleys that you get, right? You get the paper folding sequence, right? But if you don't want to fold this paper infinitely many times, you can define it this way. The nth term of the sequence is determined according to this rule, right? You take, um, you write it as an odd number times some power of two, and if the odd part is one mod four, it's a zero, which is a valley, I guess. And if the odd part is three mod four, it's a one, which would be a peak. And, right, it's not hard to check this rule with a finite automaton, right? You just have to find the rightmost one, and then whatever comes before it, right? If it's a zero, you're in the one mod four case. If it was a one, you're in the three mod four case, right? So that's another example of a um, so-called two automatic sequence, right? Because it can be computed by an automaton that takes its input in base two. Now, there's another equivalent model for these kinds of sequences. Um, namely, um, the model of morphic sequences. Sequences that can be generated by iterating a morphism. So in this case, a morphism is a map from, okay, words over some alphabet sigma to words over some alphabet delta, and it's a morphism with respect to the concatenation operation, right? And the morphism, well, because it's a morphism, to, def to give its definition, it suffices to give its definition on single letters, right? You just tell what each single letter maps to, and then it extends by concatenation. And the morphism is called k-uniform if the image of each letter in sigma is uh, a word of length k over delta. And, okay, um, a one-uniform morphism, so a morphism that just relabels letters is called a coding. And um, we're going to be looking at the class of um, words we can get by iterating a morphism and then possibly applying some coding. So let me give you an example. This morphism mu is a morphism from 0, 1 strings to 0, 1 strings. It's defined by the map that sends 0 to 0, 1. 1 to 1, 0. It's too uniform, right? These guys have length 2. And now if I start with a 0, and I just start applying the map iteratively, right? So 0 maps to 0, 1. Then I apply the map again. 0, zero 1 maps to 0, 1, 1, 0. And then 0, 1, 1, 0 maps to 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And so on. And I keep iterating. And I notice that Every, uh, every word is a prefix of the next word. So in the limit, I get some infinite word. And that infinite word is the 2a Morse sequence. All right? Well, okay. 
That infinite word is some infinite word. I haven't actually explained why it is the same to a more sequence that we saw before. Here's another example of um, this kind of construction. I define another uh, two uniform morphism, this time defined by the map A goes to AB. So this is a map from ABC to ABC. A goes to AB, B goes to BC, C goes to CC. And I again iterate starting from A, same way I did on the last slide. And I get this, I get this infinite sequence. And then I relabel the letters. So I map A and C to zero and B to one. And you can see here that what I get is ones in the positions that are powers of two. Okay. So these are examples of, um, well, okay, so these are sequences that can be generated in this case by uh, a two uniform morphism. And the important theoretical result here is this theorem, sometimes called Cobham's little, little theorem, that says that these two models that I showed you for computing sequences are equivalent, right? The model of a DFAO operating in base K will generate the same class of sequences as what I can get by iterating a K uniform morphism and then possibly um, applying a, a recoding of the alphabet. Okay, so I won't show you the proof of this. It's not actually very hard at all, but this is the, this is the, the sort of critical result, right? So that these two models uh, of sequences are equivalent. Okay, so, I mean this, so this, this particular sequence that I've showed you a couple of times, the 2A Morse sequence was introduced by 2A in 1906 um, using <coughs> morphisms. And he used that construction um, well, to show that it has many interesting combinatorial properties. Um, so, at least in combinatorics on words, we use these constructions quite often, especially these morphism type constructions, right? We, these iterated morphism constructions, we use them to generate sequences that have interesting combinatorial properties, usually. That's the point. And the kinds of properties that we're interested in are things like, well, okay, first of all, is the thing periodic or aperiodic? Because, well, the periodic ones are not very interesting. You know, is the sequence recurrent? So if you see some block of symbols that occurs once, does it occur infinitely often? Um, does the sequence avoid repetitions? That was kind of two A's thing that he was interested in. So, what I would like is a decision procedure where I give you an automatic sequence either as a morphism or uh, a DFAO, and I ask you, okay, well, does it have this property? Is it aperiodic, right? And I would like to have a decision procedure, if possible, that could do this. So it turns out that there is a, such a decision procedure, but in order to arrive at this decision procedure, I have to introduce a third equivalent model of these kinds of sequences. So we've already seen two equivalent models, right? The deterministic finite automaton with output, right? Input in base K, output something. Or iterate a K uniform morphism. And 
then recode the alphabet. There is one last equivalent model. Well, there's another one too, but I'm not gonna tell you about that one. I want you to tell you about this third one. And this one is, is a characterization in terms of logic. And it's actually, the, the model we're going to look at is an extension of the so-called Presburger arithmetic. And the Presburger arithmetic is the first order theory of the natural numbers with addition only. Addition, in other words, addition and not multiplication. So, what do I mean by that? Okay, well, first of all, it's a little bit more than just addition. You can do a few more things than just addition. So sometimes you can write out this, um, this theory a little bit more fully by including you know, the less than, the constant zero, the constant one, et cetera. But you can shorten this to n plus because all of these guys, less than, zero, one, those are all actually definable in this logic. Um, by these rules. So for example, you can define zero by the formula for every y, x plus y equals y. All right, that defines zero. And then when I have zero, I can define less than by saying, okay, x is less than y if, um, if x plus, uh, yeah, if, um, if x plus t never equals y. And then I can define one by saying, okay, well, y is one if for every z less than it, well, the only z less than it is zero. That's what I wanna say, right? So, I can define a few things, right? So I have, you know, I have less than, I have constants zero and one, uh, I have arithmetic, I mean I have addition, sorry. So the idea now is that a set of natural numbers is definable in this uh, logic if there exists a formula phi such that um, x is the set of all n that satisfy the formula phi, right? And so anything that can be defined by formulas in this Presburger arithmetic, well, it turns out that the only things you can define in this arithmetic are finite unions of arithmetic progressions. So, this may not be the most exciting theory of arithmetic, because all you can define in this theory are unions of finite sets with arithmetic progressions, and finite unions of arithmetic progressions. But, at least the theory is decidable. It's not an exciting theory, but it's a decidable theory. In other words, I give you any formula of this theory with no free variables. There is an algorithm to decide whether the formula is true or false. So you can prove anything you like about unions of arithmetic progressions. There's an algorithm to decide this. But I, like I said, this is a weak theory, right? It can only define uh, finite unions of arithmetic progressions. But we can extend this very slightly and get a much more powerful theory that is still decidable. And all we do to extend this theory is we add one, uh, one extra thing. Oh, it's still here. We just add this one extra predicate 
to the theory. So we have the, you know, the, the theory of the integers with, um, with addition. We add this one extra predicate, v sub k, for some fixed k. And all it does is it says, uh, it returns the, the largest power of k that divides your number x. Is That's it. Predicate or function? Um, function. Actually, no, no, it's predicate. It's predicate in this case. Yeah. So, I claim now that this is the third equivalent uh, model to uh, the class of automatic sequences. Right, so we've seen the, two, the first two models. A sequence is k-automatic if it can be computed by um, a DFAO working in base k, or if it can be generated by iterating a k-uniform morphism, or now the third equivalent definition if it can be defined in this logic with this extra uh, predicate um, vk. Um, so, okay, I'll show you. So the idea is pick a, so your sequence is over some alphabet, right? Let's say A, B, C, D. Pick a letter B and the positions of the Bs should be definable by some formula. So I'll give you an example. Um, so first of all, I'll give you an example of this model. This is uh, an automaton that will compute the characteristic sequence of the powers of two. I showed you already the morphism that generates it. The automaton that generates it is this one, right? You see, the only thing that reaches this state here that outputs a one is one, zero, 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 right? Powers of two. Binary representation of powers of two. One, zero, zero, zero. Gets you here. So this computes the powers of two. The characteristic sequence of the powers of two, right? So the ones appear in positions that are two to the n. So here, the idea is, okay, the positions, the positions of the ones should be definable by some formula in this logic. But in this case, the formula is simple. A number is a power of two if and only if, a number n is a power of two if and only if the highest power of two that divides it is n itself. All right, so I get this. I check this here, v2 of n equals n. Right, so that's, that defines the powers of two. And similarly, the non-powers of two, right? So the positions of the ones are defined by this formula. The positions of the zeros are defined by this formula, right? Okay, and the main point is that this theory remains decidable. The Pressburger arithmetic was decidable. If we add this VK, it's still decidable. Yeah. Ah, uh, that is a good question that I should know the answer to because it has 
Definitely been looked at. Do you know the answer? I see that there's no <laughs> Yeah, I think it's I think it's different. But at least the food doesn't work. Yeah. So it's a, it's a good question. I can't remember exactly what you get with that. I mean, it's a very natural uh, thing to do, and it for sure has been looked at, but I, I just don't remember. Thanks. So, now that we have this equivalence between the, the logic model and um, you know, the other models of automatic sequences that I told you about, that gives us a, a decidability for deciding any property of an automatic sequence that can be written down in this first order logic using addition only. And, you know, less than and various Boolean operations. And I will try roughly to explain how it all works. Um, the idea here is to take your formula and somehow build an automaton that will accept all the integers that satisfy the formula. That's, that's the idea. So the, the question is, how do you build the automaton? OK, so first of all, we represent all of our uh, integers in base k, like I told you before. We represent tuples the way I said, by writing down you know, all the you know, rightmost digits as like a single symbol, and then you know, all the second digits and all the third digits all in parallel, right? So your, um, your automaton will be reading all the digits of the numbers in your tuple in parallel. And yeah, we have the usual padding stuff that I told you about. The most important thing is that we need to be able to compute addition with the automaton, right? That's, that's the main operation of this logic, right? It's just it's the first order theory of the natural numbers with addition. And so if I want to build an automaton that will accept all the integers satisfying a formula, the main thing I need to do is I need to have an automaton that can check addition. So in this case, this automaton computes the addition relation. Right, so it reads these triples, A, B, and C. These are the digits of X, Y, and Z, such that X plus Y equals Z, all right? And so, I mean, it shouldn't be too hard for you to convince yourself that this automaton does check correctly the addition, right? The usual addition, you know, symbol by symbol with a carry, um, except the only thing is um, our automata processes its input from left to right. In other words, from most significant digit to least significant digit. So it's checking this addition in the reverse order, right? It's checking from the most significant digit reading towards the, le uh, the least significant digit. So just doing it in the reverse of how a normal human would do it, all right? But whatever, it's, it's the same, right? State A here is the state where there's no carry coming from the future, right? And state B is, okay, there is, there is a carry that has to be resolved, right? So okay, if there's no carry, well then the, the three digits that you see at any one time at a given position should just satisfy A plus B equals C. But if they don't, right, if they satisfy instead A plus one, B plus one equals C, well that means that I needed a carry. 
I needed to actually add the carry to get C, so there was a carry. So I move to the carry state, right? And then I stay here as long as I kept seeing carries. And then finally, when the carry goes away, I come back to the no carry state, right? So the, the automaton just checks addition, right? The usual base K um, addition in columns, except it's checking it from left to right. Okay, so the automata, I have an automaton that can check the addition relation. Now for the various other operators in the logic, so less than, our equality is easy, right? You just check if the things are equal, it's fine. Uh, less than is also not very hard, um, right? You can check if, you know, base K representation of one number is less than the other, it's pretty easy. Um, the multiplication, we will we'll need for our purposes to be able to multiply by a constant, which is okay because for any specific constant, we can just implement that by repeated addition, right? So that's fine. Um, but just remember that um, multiplication is not, multiplication of variables is not allowed, right, in this particular logic. And, well, one reason that multiplication is not allowed is that if we did have a first order theory with both addition and multiplication, that would automatically become an undecidable theory. This is a classical result of logic. So, we definitely cannot have multiplication because if we did, we would have no hope of having a decidable theory. Um, okay, so the other logical operations. The arithmetic operations are dealt with by the addition automaton, right? And then, okay, you can easily figure out the automaton to check equality or less than. Now we need automata to implement the logical operations. But for most of those, it's pretty easy. So for things like or, and, and et cetera, or can be implemented by taking the union. All right, we have a construction for taking the union of two automata that does or, right? There are constructions for intersection that will give you and, right? Standard constructions for the intersection of two automata will give you and. The other logical operations can be implemented from that. Um, the only issues are the quantifiers. And quantifiers are implemented in this case by non-determinism. So the existential quantifier is implemented using non-determinism. And the universal quantifier is just implemented using negation of the existential quantifier. Right, and this is where what I said before about um, conversion between non-deterministic and deterministic automata comes in. For most of what we're doing, we're working with deterministic automata, but to implement an existential quantifier, we need to introduce a non-deterministic automaton, and then we have to determinize it, okay? And here's the, here's the implications of that. So imagine you have some formula with quantifiers, exists for all, or exists for all, or exists for all, right? Every time there is an alternation of quantifiers, there's going to be some introduction of non-determinism that then has to be determinized in order to, like, to do the negation of, a, of an existential, you introduce a non-deterministic 
Um, you introduce non-determinism to handle the existential quantifier, but then to take negation, you have to determinize, right? To take the complement of the language accepted by an automaton, you have to have a deterministic automaton. You have to convert <laughs> to a deterministic automaton. So every time there's an alternation of quantifiers, you have to introduce non-determinism to what you have already, and then determinize your automaton. And this happens every single time there's an alternation of quantifiers. So at every single quantifier alternation, your possible automaton blows up exponentially in terms of what you had at the previous step, right? So at the first alternation, you could go from n states to two to the n states. And at the next alternation, you would blow up again to two to the two to the n states. And at the next quantifier alternation, you would go up again to two to the two to the two to the n, and so on. So if you have a big formula with lots of alternating quantifiers, the possible size of the automaton you could get in the very worst case is a tower of exponentials, two to the two to the two to the two to the n. As many times, your tower is as high as the number of alternations of quantifiers that you had in your formula. But this actually doesn't usually happen for you know, things that you do naturally in practice, most of the time you do not get such a huge um, blow up in states. But if you're doing something really complicated, okay, potentially on a computer you may need a very large memory to hold these intermediate automata that can be pretty massive. Okay, that was all for the base K, the integer base numeration system, right? So the idea was I had some uh, logical formula defining some set of integers that are supposed to be the positions of the Bs in some sequence, right? And I can convert that formula into an automaton, right? By converting all the logical operators and the addition um, so let's say I want to do this now in the Fibonacci base. So I want to compute a sequence in the same way as I did before, except instead of giving, right, instead of giving n to my automaton in a base k, I give n to my automaton in the Fibonacci base, in the Fibonacci representation, right? The automaton reads it in the Fibonacci enumeration system, and then you know ends at some state and outputs some value just like just like in the integer base case. Um, but otherwise it's the same, right? So it's exactly the same as I showed you before for the integer base, but I now provide my input in the Fibonacci base. So Everything I showed you before can be done in the Fibonacci base. Again, like the, you know, checking equality and checking less than, checking this or that. It can all be done. The main complication is addition, right? Addition in the integer base was pretty simple. I showed you the automaton on the screen, it just had two states, carry or no carry, very simple to figure out what it should be. Um, but the Fibonacci automaton is much more complicated. It's this big 17 state thing. It's not, uh, not very simple, but it exists, that's the point. There is an automaton that can check the addition relation for the Fibonacci numeration system as well. So as long as you have that, you can just still do exactly the same thing we just did, all right? So 
Here's an example of a so-called Fibonacci automatic sequence. So a sequence that can be computed by an automaton using the Fibonacci numeration system, and it's the Fibonacci word. So here, here it is. It's defined by iterating this now non-uniform morphism, right? Previously in the integer base k system, we were only iterating k uniform morphisms, but now we have this non-uniform morphism. Zero goes to zero, one, one goes to zero. So I start with zero, zero goes to zero, one, zero, one goes to zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero goes to zero, one, zero, zero, one, et cetera, et cetera, right? You iterate and you get this infinite word called the Fibonacci word. But you can also chat, you can also compute this with an automaton where you give n to the automaton in the Fibonacci base, the automaton reads it, and then just looks at what the last digit is. It's either zero or one. If it's zero, it outputs zero. If it's one, it outputs one. You do that, you, you get this sequence, right? Um, here it is. Here's the automaton, right, that computes this in Fibonacci base. Right, so it reads something. You'll notice that this state here, the one that outputs one, it does not have any further transition on a one because you're not allowed to see one one. Right, that was forbidden, so that is not, those inputs are simply discarded, right? And so, yeah, this automaton just reads your string if you end here, that means you just saw one, you output one. If you end here, that means you just saw previously a zero, you output zero. And yeah, this is like I said, um, you can I implement the same construction I showed you before. The important thing is that there is an automaton that can check addition in the Fibonacci numeration system. Okay, now finally I can uh, start explaining what Walnut does. Well, Walnut implements the decision procedure that I sketched, right? So Walnut, so, um, well, Jeffrey Shalit's student, Hamoun Musavi, implemented this decision procedure in Java in a package called Walnut. And the way it works is if you want to check some property of an automatic sequence, right, you provide as input, um, well, the DFAO for the sequence, and then a statement in the first order logic describing the property of the sequence that you want to check. And the software will simply verify. If there are no free variables in your formula, the, the software will decide and tell you either the formula is true or the formula is false. If there are free variables in the formula, what it will instead do is give you an automaton accepting the base k representations of the non-negative integers that satisfy the formula. And okay, so I'll, I'll show you some of the commands, how it does this. It translates Basically, you have to be able to input some um, formula in first order logic. It does this in a very sort of straightforward conversion. Symbol E means the existential quantifier. Symbol A means the universal quantifier. The tilde for negation, kind of fairly obvious symbols to represent and or implies negation and so on.
You also have to tell the software what numeration system you're working in. So you tell it base K, base Fibonacci. Uh, you also tell it whether you're working with most significant digit first, which is the only thing we've done so far, right? So far, I've only talked about um, working most in the most significant digit first representation, but you could, and it is possible to work um, with everything in uh, least significant digit first representation as well. Uh, if you don't say anything about what numeration system, it's assumed to be base two most significant digit first. Okay, so here's a really simple example to start with that doesn't even involve um, an automatic sequence. So for example, if I want to define the even integers, right, well, okay, an integer is even if there exists a natural number k such that n equals 2k, right? So you write that in Walnut. There exists k such that n equals 2 times k, right? Just give it a name, call it is even. And what this will do, by default, it assumes that this is binary most significant digit first. You type this command into Walnut and execute it. It will output an automaton accepting the base two representations of the even numbers. That's, that's it. It's also convenient to be able to um, specify certain um, sort of, to be able to specify certain languages by giving it to Walnut in terms of a regular expression. Um, so you can do that too, right? You can provide Walnut with uh, a regular expression defining some language of binary strings. In this case, this Right, so this is the sort of union, uh, right, star is cleany star in this case, right? So this is a regular expression accepting strings that what? Strings that may have some leading zeros, right? This is a zero star, some leading zeros. Then a one then just some binary digits, right? One union zero star, and then ends with a zero, right? So even numbers, right? So this time I give it to Walnut as, uh, as a regular expression, and I can check this, that those two things are the same, right? that, um, you know, what I got with this um, regular expression is exactly uh, the even numbers as defined by the formula on this page. Okay, that's just, okay, that's just to show you a couple of basic uh, commands. Um, okay, let's try something a little bit more complicated. Here's a variation on the 2A Morse sequence. Remember the 2A Morse sequence was computed by um, checking the parity of the number of ones in the binary representation of n. Well, okay, if you did it by counting the parity of zeros, you get a different sequence. In this case, called the twisted 2A Morse sequence. It can be defined by iterating this morphism, 0 to 0, 1, 1 to 2, 1, uh, 2 to 1, 2. All right, basically it's just some kind of, yeah, it's just some twist on the 2A Morse morphism. And then there's this recoding, 0, 1 go to 0, and 2 goes to 1. And 
let's check that it's the automaton for it, the DFAO, is built into Walnut um, as TTM, twisted to a Morse. So Walnut already knows it. And what I want to do here is check that um, if I provide this morphism, I will get the same sequence as what is computed by the DFAO that's already built into Walnut. So here again are a few more commands. So this first command, what you do is you provide a morphism to Walnut, and the morphism command will convert that to the DFAO that generates the sequence you would get by iterating that morphism starting with zero. So this converts a morphism to a, well, sorry, this just stores the morphism, promote converts it to a DFAO, promote. So morphism just inputs the morphism, promote converts the morphism into the equivalent DFAO, we, same thing for the coding, except this time, since the coding is an image then applied to the, uh, to the fixed point, we use the image command that applies the coding to this guy, TTM1, and sort of state, saves that in another DFAO, TTM2. And then I check that TTM2 gives me the same thing as the built-in um, twisted to a more sequence, right? So this really does generate the same sequence. So these are the commands that you would use if you had uh, a morphism that you wanted to work with and you wanted to provide it to Walnut um, to do some computations with. Yeah, this is what I said. Promote converts the morphism to a DFAO. Image applies a morphism to a DFAO and produces a new DFAO. Um, okay, here's another two automatic sequence. Um, this one is called the period doubling word and it is generated by iterating this morphism 0 maps to 1, 1, 1 maps to 1, 0, starting with 1. So 1 goes to 1, 0, then 1, 0 goes to 1, 0, 1, 1, and so on. So you can see from the morphism definition, right, since the first letter of this image is a 1, the first letter of this image is a 1, that there'll be a 1 in every even position, right? That's pretty obvious from the morphism. Um, if I wanted to check this fairly obvious property with Walnut, right, so what am I saying? Uh, the formula I want to check is that if I is even, well then there's a one in position I of the period doubling word, right? So I enter this uh, into Walnut by giving first the formula for the even numbers that we've already seen, and then a command that will check this formula, right? So for all i, it will first check, right? After I've defined this is even, um, I check is i even. If i is even, that implies that in position i of period doubling, there should be a one, okay? And this at symbol is used to uh, when I want to refer to the, uh, the values of, um, of the automatic sequence rather than like the positions, right? So I want to say that in position I, there is the symbol one, at one. Okay, so I can check something slightly more complicated, 
right? I can check, for example, that this sequence does not contain 0, 0. Again, this is obvious from the morphism, right? But if I wanted to write that as a formula, I just check, OK, the, it is not true that there exists a position i where I see a 0 in position i and I see a 0 in the next position, i plus 1. Right? You type this into walnut and walnut will output true. OK. One more example of finding things in um, the period doubling word. Let's say I wanted to find all occurrences of the substring 0, 1, 1. I want to find the positions, where they, where they all occurred, right? So again, I can write a fairly stupid formula like this, right? In position i, there's a 0. In and in position i plus 1, there is a 1. And in position i plus 2, there is a 1. And I will find all 0, 1, 1s. You'll notice that in this particular formula, there's a free variable variable i. So what Walnut does in this case is it returns an automaton that accepts the language of all binary representations of i for which this formula is true. Right? So this is what Walnut would output. It would output this automaton. Right? So any binary string accepted by this automaton would be the binary representation of an i where there is a 0, 1, 1 at position i. So for example, right, the string, if I input a 1, 0, 0, 1 into this automaton, which is 9, right? If I follow 1, 0, 0, 1 in this automaton, I end up here, which is an accepting state. This automaton accepts 1, 0, 0, 1. So it accepts 9, which means that there should be a 0, 1, 1 at position 9 in the period doubling word. And I can check 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There it is, right? Starting at position 9, there's a 0, 1, 1, right? And so this automaton tells me all of the positions where there are 0, 1, 1s. OK, that is probably a good place to stop for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions to the speaker? So maybe I missed something, uh, but uh, but so if you have a k-uniform morphism, you use k-based system, and also you have one very special uh, system which is Fibonacci. But uh, there are many po possible morphisms. What can be? Are there some other systems which can be useful, or how do you deal with all these things? Okay, yeah, so that is, uh, okay, that's a great question. Um, I will talk about it a little bit later, um, so I guess in the, the second lecture, but uh, for now the main point is, okay, this will not work for every morphism. If I write down some random non-uniform morphism, Chances are this will not work, this whole um, um, procedure. What will work, so somehow there has, to be, there has to be some underlying enumeration system where addition is computable by a finite automaton. So in the case of that one non-uniform morphism, 0 goes to 0, 1, 1 goes to 0, Underlying this, um, this morphism, there's, uh, there's the Fibonacci 
uh, numeration system. And in that particular numeration system, addition can be computed by uh, a finite automaton. I can write down, I mean, I won't do it now, but in principle, one can write down a morphism where there would be no, um, where the, the underlying numeration system would not have addition computable by an automaton. And in general, it, 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 it's known to be sometimes undecidable or for, for arbitrary morphism. Yeah, I can. Uh, I have an example of that. Um, I will show it in the next in the next lecture uh, of a morphism that would lead to uh, an undecidable uh, logic. Basically, well, I, I it's a spoiler, but I you can write down a morphism, for example, that would um, encode the sequence of squares, mm -hmm. like one, four, nine, whatever. And if you ha if you have addition and squares, it's an undecidable theory. It's just like if you had addition and multiplication. If you have addition and squares, this is also undecidable. So yeah, there, I, yeah, I can produce an, un, an undecidable system like that. Thank you. And I know that there are more questions. Just a moment. Uh, I have a naive question. Uh, when you uh, ask, uh, you, if you give a formula without free variable to Walnut, it can understand, it can answer uh, true or false, and this is remarkable. But sometimes we would like to know better. Can Walnut give a proof, uh, explain why it is true or why it is false? Because sometimes we like not only to have the answer to a conjecture, but to know why this answer is correct. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay, that's a good question. I mean, in many cases, uh, you, you are right. It will simply give you an answer without any, without any intuition. It's, it's true. I mean, sometimes if you, instead of asking for true or false, you write your formula with some free variable and you can examine the automaton and maybe understand something about why those particular values make it true. But um, there are many cases where um, really, no, it will just, it will, tell, it will tell you true or false without giving you any, any intuition um, why, why it is true or false. But I guess the, the converse to this is that it can also sometimes give you very short proofs of something that you would have to do by hand with a very long, tedious case analysis, right? There's, you know, there are many proofs in the combinatorics on words literature where you know, the proof is just a very tedious, lengthy analysis of cases, right? You know, if this string begins with a zero, then this, and then if it begins with zero, one, then this, and a very long case analysis, and you can, uh, you know, eliminate, you know, these long, tedious proofs by a very quick verification. So yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's good and bad, I guess. But it does provide the proof in formal system. It's just not intuitive. Yes, exactly. No, I mean the proof is the, is the proof. Yeah, it is. It is, if it says true. It is, that's the proof. Um, but yes, it's the question is, yeah, does it give you some kind of human intuition about, uh, about why it's true? And the answer is not always. Thank you. So um, kind of related to this, uh, the, if I understand correctly, the, I mean, there's, there's some really giant, uh, 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 DFA that uh, that answers every uh, logical uh, statement, right? Uh, or ev every sentence. A and is that what it's doing, or it's it's uh, like is the software generating some simpler? I mean, it must like uh, f case by case, it's generating some uh, some DFA that it then. Yeah, like it, it, it will generate a DFA the, uh, in stages. So it will, uh -huh. it kind of, you start with the DFA that encodes the sequence that you're asking questions about. 
Um, and then you, you have your formula, um, you know, defining the property of, of the sequence that you're checking, and it will build up in stages. For each operation, it will construct a, a, a new automaton. Like, for example, if you have an AND, it will you know, do an intersection of two automata. And if the next state, if the next operation is an addition, it will build an automaton to do the addition in the next stage. And it will build up automata in stages as you, um, as you progress, as you expand through the formula. And is there a way to output like whatever that automaton is? Like, uh, like it answers true or false and also gives you maybe this really giant, messy automaton. Yeah, if you, I mean, if you, so if you, if you actually run the software, if you kind of run it in the more sort of verbose output flag, it will output um, a kind of log of, um, of the subformulas at each stage uh -huh. and the size of the automaton generated um, for each subformula. So you'll get a bit of a log as it, as it sort of does it. Um, for the subformulas and the sizes of the automata. Um, if you actually want to look at the intermediate automata, you kind of have to actually um, break it. You actually have to kind of write down the formula just for the sub uh, the subautomaton. It won't it won't output every subautomaton itself, but it will give you a log of their sizes and how long it took to compute them. Okay, right, thanks. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Uh, well, this is a bit of a simpler question. <laughs> we we said we didn't discuss formally what is uh, um, square free and all this in this lecture, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I that will well, that yeah that that will be for the uh, the next uh, the next lecture. Yeah. Okay, no, I was just wanting to make sure. Yeah, no, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, basically, uh, first thing, first thing in the next lecture, we'll start talking about all these combinatorial properties of squares and overlaps and, and periodicity and all that stuff. Thank you. Maybe just one more question, if somebody has it. Do we understand which morphic words are um, Fibonacci automatic words? I don't think there is an obvious way to decide. Yeah, I mean, if, if somebody just wrote down a morphism and asked, is this Fibonacci automatic, um, no, there would be no obvious algorithm to decide if it was or, or wasn't. Okay. And we have another example from the Fibonacci word, Fibonacci automatic. Yes, um, yes for sure. Um, could I write one down right now? Probably not, but um, I can look one up and write it down uh, in the next lecture. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, just this, the sum of digits in uh, just the Fibonacci numeration systems. Yeah, OK, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you can do something like that. Like, uh, yeah, 2 way Morse was the sum of digits in, in binary mod 2. So yeah, you could do, yeah, you could define a word or a sequence the same way for, for Fibonacci, yeah. Take the sum of digits mod two with respect to n written in Fibonacci base. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I guess the rest of questions, if you want to ask them, will be during the coffee break. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>